Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Kate Brooks analyzes hog and cattle markets. Dave Hamilton explains why the Nebraska Cattleman is recommending not pursuing a state-based checkoff program. Brad Lubin looks at differences in House and Senate Farm Bill proposals. Stephen Wagulo updates us on wheat disease in Nebraska. And Bob Wright advises producers to scout their emerging corn. U.S. farmers are making major strides according to the USDA's latest crop progress numbers. 71% of this year's corn has now been planted, improving 43 points from the previous week. That quick pace was enough to tie a record for percentage increase, and individually of the top 12 corn producing states, seven increased by 41 points or more. Farmers have also made a jump in soybean planting as 24% of that crop is now in the ground with 3% emerged. There was an important announcement from the USDA last Friday related to a new virus affecting hogs. New because it's the first time porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or PEDV, was confirmed in the United States. Later in the show, we'll talk about the virus with Nebraska State Veterinarian Dennis Hughes. It's important to specify up front the virus has no effect on meat and therefore human consumption. The virus only affects production. UNL Extension economist Kate Brooks is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with Kate Friday morning after the latest USDA Livestock Slaughter Report. Not a lot of surprises, you know, we were, if we look at April this year over last year, we were up some um, on the cattle side. You know, we saw some increases in steers and heifers. Some of that increase in heifers could be, you know, we held a bunch of heifers back January 1. Um, some of that can be some of those heifers going um, on to market. The other is cow slaughter. That's the one that kind of drove some of this increase. Uh, we've seen an increase in cow slaughter in the last several months. That uh, the numbers were up all across the board. So is there liquidation in that then? Yes, I, I think we're seeing some liquidation. You know, we we saw that ex extenuation mm -hmm. um, of the not the of the winter weather. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we couldn't get our cows out on pasture. We used up more hay stock right, right. Um, and we're going to probably continue. We were down 43 percent um, over last year of May 1 hay stocks. Um, so I think some of that cow slaughter is a little bit more continuation of liquidation. Let's start in the cattle market. So we've shaved a few dollars here in the last few weeks and uh, just put simply, when does this nightmare end? Is there anything on the horizon? Uh, again, I wish I had, you know, that crystal <laughs> ball, you know, box beef cut out. We finally hit that magical $200 per hundred weight that everybody was talking about several weeks ago. You know, if we kind of look into that a little bit, if we go back, you know, looking at live cattle back June 1 contract, futures contract back in December or January, we were at 132, 133. As we moved into March, we hit that 122. Well, that kind of probably talk, you know, a lot of retailers mm -hmm. kind of looked at that, saw some potential to get some, you know, Memorial Day or even Mother's Day specials out, um, probably bought up some more boxed beef. Well, as we come into May, they probably had used a lot of those supplies up from the packers. Therefore, you know, with limited supply, that box beef has jumped. We're well, this was this was maybe the time that uh, we were going to see a record high, right? I mean, right. this was the time we were supposed to be ramping up to it, and we're completely the opposite. Yes, yep, yep. We're seeing that complete difference. We're just not seeing, you know, that increase in the supplies as we had thought. Quantify the concerns of beef demand for me. You know, <laughs> If you talk about, you know, a $7 steak, mm -hmm. you know, on sale here for Memorial Day weekend with 70 degree temperatures, mm -hmm. it sounds great to go out and grill, right? <laughs> yeah. If we move forward and we're looking at even higher price beef in July when the temperatures are warm, 
it doesn't seem as appealing. So as we go forward, I don't know that we'll maintain that box beef level at the you know 211. I think is what we hit the other mm -hmm. day records. I think hopefully we don't go below that $200 level, and hopefully in the fourth quarter we start to see those prices go back up, and then we'll you know hopefully dwindle that down through the through the chain. Mm -hmm. Quick analysis of pork here. It's kind of on the other side here. They're not doing so bad. Right. They've actually seen some increases. They've seen some improvements in their margins, and they actually look like they're ramping up for um, increased production if we do get, you know, the corn records that we're saying we'll have. Any help from the export front on either beef or pork? Um, you know, I think there is potential for that side, but again, we're still doing dealing with the increasing value of the dollar, so it's making our products more expensive on the other mm -hmm. side. Overall, pork demand, is, uh, is there any opportunity maybe for them to get a share of the market here if beef does drive up? It could, you know, I'm, it's the price of, the retail price for beef continues to rise, so does pork, but not to the extent the beef price has risen, and so we may start to see some switching from, uh, you know, some of the beef to the pork. Now, which products we'll, we'll see, we'll, you know, we'll yet to determine um, as we move forward. Next week, we'll look at corn and soybean markets with Elaine Cub. After nine meetings across the state, the Nebraska cattleman has decided not to pursue a state-based checkoff program. Through late winter and early spring, a task force met with producers to get their input on obtaining a set amount for each cow sold, which would then be used for promotion, education, and research. Dave Hamilton, a rancher from Thedford and chairman of the Nebraska Cattlemen Marketing and Commerce Committee, explains how months of drought affected the decision. The task force met about a week ago. And, and it was uh, by consensus, nearly everyone, uh, or everyone, I should say, is uh, of the same mind that uh, the timing has changed. When we started this process a little over a year ago of suggesting a proposed checkoff, state beef checkoff, to supplement the national checkoff, why all sectors of the industry were, were profitable at the time and we were not mired in a drought, that was so devastating to all of agriculture, and especially Nebraska, I think, over the other states. And that, coupled with the uh, reaction at the nine state meetings that we had around the state to inform and, uh, the producers and, and take questions from them, uh, that reaction uh, told us that uh, maybe the timing wasn't right now. And so the task force has decided to not go forward with a proposed referendum to see what producers thought that we were going to uh, put this on the shelf for a while. Hamilton says he thinks the subject of a state-based checkoff program will come up again in the future, but there's no timetable for that. Based off many discussions held in Washington over the last week, there's a chance a new farm bill may be on the horizon. The House and the Senate, controlled by different parties, have differing versions of the legislation. We discussed that Thursday afternoon with UNL Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin. But before our Farm Bill conversation, we asked Brad about the final decision on Acre and DCP farmers need to make in the very near future. We've talked quite a bit about what this decision in 2013 is about, the protection of Acre versus the 20% penalty of giving that part of the DP. But in May, USDA published new data it all matters. Uh, the price forecast that USDA published for the first time in the 2013 crop come out in May, those forecasts are pretty weak for corn, soybeans, and wheat. That makes acre more relevant. Uh, in fact, puts acre in the money for, for dryland soybeans and not that far away for, for irrigated soybeans or dryland corn. Uh, we also saw production numbers from USDA. A 33 bushel yield projected right now for Nebraska wheat that already would put Acre in the money for 2013 at, at current price projections, current yield projections. So, so suddenly we knew Acre had more safety but maybe didn't have as high a return. For some crops, Acre is very, very relevant here for 2013. So soybeans, wheat would be in the money. How close is corn? Corn is the safety net as we calculate it, trend yields, current mm -hmm. price expectations. The safety net for corn is out of the money, but you're talking about a 470 projected price for USDA. I'm not into price projections. Mm -hmm. I don't know what what individual producers might think about that number. Uh, it would take a 420 to, to 450 price to trigger acre payments for corn if we were to reach trend yields. If you're a little bit less than optimistic on dry land yields and you're concerned about price, mm -hmm. there you are. Let's move into the Farm Bill discussions. The House and Senate both have their versions. The Senate actually moved theirs down to the floor, so we're actually we're, we're getting somewhere That's here, right. Brad. What does the timeline look like? That's right. It's it's amazing after two plus years of watching this and, and looking at, at steps that, that didn't come to fruition, we've moved very quickly. The House and Senate Ag Committees marked up their bills last week. 
The Senate uh, brought it to the floor already on Monday. Uh, the, the typical amendment by amendment debate and, and deliberation continues, but we're very likely to see a Senate Farm Bill done by the end of the month. Uh, the House has promised to pick theirs up in mid-June. Uh, we could very well see both bills done uh, here in, by late June, but a big challenge for a conference committee to, to iron out the differences. That may take most of the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still looking at late summer before we could even contemplate uh, maybe uh, both chambers considering a compromise bill. And we've got a lot of big questions about what that compromise bill would look like. There are obviously big differences with right. uh, Democratic-controlled Senate, Republican-controlled House. Right. SNAP is one of the big ones. Let's talk about crop insurance. How does yes. that differ between the two? Well, fundamentally, it's this question is one for the future, um, starting with this bill. Mm. How much do we look at the commodity program as a safety net versus how much do we look at the crop insurance program as a safety net? Uh, should the commodity program protect price or should it protect revenue? Well, how should it integrate with crop insurance? Crop insurance has become the biggest part of the safety net, and clearly farm state senators and, and representatives uh, of ag districts certainly seem to be fighting for crop insurance first. We've got to maintain that component of the safety net. Um, several ag interests, particularly uh, southern commodities, would still like to see a heavy price component, uh, so that debate continues as well. Brad will join us again next week to discuss country of origin labeling news. As of Friday, May 17th, the U.S. has confirmed cases of porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or PEDV. First diagnosed in Great Britain in 1971, PEDV has broken out occasionally in Europe and is widespread in Asia. As of this taping, confirmation of the virus had been reported in four U.S. states, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, and Colorado. Three of those are in the top five for hog production. PEDV spreads through either a fecal or oral route, and there is no effective vaccine. As I noted at the beginning of the show, this emergence is of no threat to meat consumption, only production. It also shouldn't have an impact on trade, as there aren't any restrictions because of the virus. We talked with Nebraska State Veterinarian Dennis Hughes Wednesday about how PEDV affects a pig and how you can take precautionary steps to minimize your farm's chance of holding the virus. Porcine epidemic diarrhea virus is a disease that uh, has been recently diagnosed in the United States just in the last week. It's a viral disease that causes uh, diarrhea and vomiting in all ages of swine. Uh, what is particularly uh, devastating is when it hits uh, neonatal or suckling pigs. What's your level of concern on this for Nebraska? Well, as we understand right now, this disease is not in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. We hope it does not occur in Nebraska, but uh, it would be a, a major economic impact uh, to any uh, fair to finish herd if we uh, uh, had newborn infant pigs of uh, death mortality. It would be very significant. Explain to me the comparisons or compare and contrast the, the TGE to PEDV, transmittable gastroenteritis. How similar are they? Okay. TGE, transmissible gastroenteritis, is an old disease that we've known in the swine industry for decades. This disease is a, quote, close cousin. It's, uh, they're both caused by a coronavirus. Uh, they would be uh, very hard to distinguish clinically, mm -hmm. and they can only distinguish in a laboratory uh, by submission to a, a accredited federal laboratory. So therefore, the producer can't really do anything him or herself. They have to go through the veterinarian if they find the symptoms. Exactly. Uh, one of our fears is that a producer might presume it's TGE and, and uh, make a, a diagnosis on his own without doing submissions to a, a, a veterinarian who would take samples to a, a, a non-lab, which would then refer them to uh, NVSL for confirmation of PED. If a producer were to get it, uh, correct me if I'm right on this, and this is, I believe, the same in TGE, if the sow or the gilt had it, they could treat the uh, farrowing or the wean pigs with uh, something through the milk, but once those pigs are weaned, they're susceptible again to the virus. Yes, uh, immunity can be developed in about two to three weeks. The problem is that baby suckling pigs, uh, neonatal pigs, are so vulnerable to dehydration mm -hmm. that uh, they crash and burn, so to speak, in about 24, 36 hours. So if they can survive that initial uh, assault, uh, they, they may be able to develop immunity. Uh, unfortunately, the, the mortality on that age of pigs is 80% plus. Mm -hmm. What's your recommendation then for producers? Is it something where you say, call the veterinarian if you think you might have a suspicion of it? First thing you need to do is implement 
excellent biosecurity. You got to know where you've been. You don't track it back home with anybody else that's got TGE or coronavirus, uh, PED. These are both very uh, susceptible diseases that you would bring in by uh, poor biosecurity. Uh, there is no vaccine yet. There may be. But uh, right now, you need to take all precautions not to track disease onto your farm by where you've been or where hogs have been moving from farm to farm. Uh, disease itself, uh, if, you, if pigs have survived that initial insult of dehydration, they can be treated with electrolytes and fluids and usually uh, can survive. But unfortunately, mortality is very high within the first few days of life. At what point do you recommend calling the vet? Uh, immediately once you see okay. symptoms with uh, vomiting and diarrhea, when you see particularly uh, a, a typical situation is a producer walks in the farrowing barn and it looks like an explosion of, of vomiting and yeah. diarrhea in these uh, baby pigs, uh, that's time to call a veterinarian immediately. Now on the Market Journal website, you can see our interview with Kansas State University veterinarian and swine specialist Steve Dritz. Steve explains why American pigs are so susceptible to PEDV and which areas of the operating industry he would consider hot for the virus. One of Steve's colleagues is originally from Thailand. You can hear our interview on how PEDV impacted her family's farm. Among the top 18 producing winter wheat states, Nebraska is one of only three with no wheat rated as excellent. The others are Texas and South Dakota. Overall, this hasn't been a perfect year for production as only 31% of the U.S. winter wheat crop is rated good or excellent. That's the lowest rating in those categories at this time of the year since 2006. With growers trying to maximize their yield here in Nebraska, Stephen Wagulo gave us an update Wednesday on disease issues, starting with an update on rust concerns. Across the state, uh, the risk for rust remains low. Uh, we have had um, one observation of stripe rust uh, at mid uh, in Saunders County. Uh, this was about two weeks ago. But we have not had any new reports of rust. And this is mainly because the amount of spores of rust that blew up from the southern states to into our region has just been very low this year. And so we have uh, very little um, stripe rust and we have not seen any leaf rust so far. What else are you looking at right now? What are some of the other diseases that are maybe giving growers problems? Well, right now, the major diseases we are seeing are the leaf spots and, uh, you know, there are two main ones, septoria leaf blotch. We call it septoria uh, leaf blotch and then tan spot. So these are leaf spots. They start um, in the lower canopy and they, they work their way up the canopy and they are favored by um, wet weather and if wheat was drilled into wheat stubble then the risk is pretty high because uh, the, the two fungi that cause those two diseases overwinter on uh, wheat stubble. At what point do you think about treating them with a the fungicide? We recommend to time to, to protect the flag leaf. Okay. If the flag leaf is not threatened then you are, pro, you are, you are fine and especially if um, you know, it, it doesn't rain, uh, the conditions for uh, the, those two diseases developing up to the flag leaf are pretty, you know, unfavorable. Uh, but if you have rain or you have uh, irrigated wheat, then you, you need to keep scouting and monitoring. And if they approach the flag leaf, you have to be prepared to uh, apply a fungicide to protect the flag leaf. On average, the wheat across Nebraska is not in excellent condition, but uh, it's also behind normal and right. a few weeks behind where we were at this point last year. With some of it starting to get into that heading stage, what issues might arise? Well, in the heading stage, one of the concerns we have um, is uh, Fusarium head blight or scab. It's also called scab. And in areas where we have precipitation during heading and especially around flowering, uh, the risk for fusarium head blight can, uh, can be high if we have rain. And so um, folks need to monitor the weather. If the wheat is flowering and, um, or heading and wet weather is forecast, then usually we recommend applying a fungicide at early flowering and that can significantly reduce the uh, damage caused by fusarium head blight. So right now the risk in Nebraska is low, but it can change depending on weather conditions. 
If you're using a fungicide, Stephen says it's important to note any label restrictions that may apply. We'll link to his recent CropWatch article on the same subject on the Market Journal homepage. The number of Nebraska irrigators participating in the Nebraska Ag Water Management Network has reached 900 and it's still growing. In the May Nebraska Farmer, you can see how the network has evolved since it started in 2005. Irrigators rely on watermark soil sensors and evapotranspiration gauges like the one shown here to determine when to water their crop. In the process, users average a water savings of 2.2 inches per year. You can read more about the program in May's Nebraska Farmer. Barring inclement weather, we plan to show you next week how to install and use these tools. The majority of Nebraska's corn is now in the ground and emergence is well underway with 26 percent of the crop above the ground as of the latest USDA report. That means the plant is now susceptible to injury from certain kinds of insects. We talked with Bob Wright Monday about wireworms, white grubs, and a variety of cutworms. Since cutworms can injure the corn within the first week of emergence, we started there by asking how farmers can scout their fields. The insects themselves aren't too much active during the day, but if you see feeding damage on the leaves or the, the stem is cut at the ground level, you want to dig around the soil and see if you can find a cutworm and uh, note the size of it. Uh, that's important in terms of how much longer it's going to be feeding. But it's really important to scout your field now as the corn emerges because cutworms can cause damage relatively quickly and uh, there is a rescue treatment available, so it is important to check and see if you need to treat uh, pretty soon. And all types of corn, all hybrids are fair game? Well, there are some, some of the BT corns are active against some of the cutworms, but not all the cutworms. And we have a lot of different types of cutworms in Nebraska, so it's, but it's safer to scout everything regardless. And the seed treatments as well can have some effect on cutworms, but high densities can overwhelm them. What are the treatments either if you're looking at the army cutworm or the black cutworm, what are the treatment recommendations or thresholds? Well, it's basically somewhere in the range of uh, three to four percent cut plants with the value of corn we have now would be a treatable level. Uh, again, you want to make sure the cutworms aren't very large, like over, over an inch long, because they may have already done all their feeding. But there, and there are several different insecticide options, uh, primarily the, the uh, pyrethroid insecticides or products containing Lorsban would be good against cutworms. Let's move into some other things that are more difficult to control this season, wireworms especially. What am I supposed to be looking for there? Well, typically uh, uh, some of the early season pests can cause lack of emergence or damaged plants that when they emerge. So uh, if you have a poor stand, you'd want to dig around and where plants should be and see if you can find the seeds, see if it germinated and got killed or if it's uh, deformed, maybe there's an insect below ground that's feeding on it. Unfortunately for wireworms or white grubs, there's no rescue treatment. So right now the only decision would be whether to replant or whether you can live with that population. If you do replant, do you recommend treating the seed? Yeah, it, it, it probably, if you are gonna re replant, you do wanna retreat the seed or have treated seed. There may be still some insects that can cause damage and you wanna get a good stand the second time. You mentioned white grubs, is that something to be looking at, looking for now or in the future? No, there are some species of white grubs that uh, can cause damage now and they could cause uh, early poor stands early in the season. So uh, again, first see injury and then see what's causing the injury. Those are wireworms and white grubs are feed below ground. So you need to dig around the base of the plant or where the seed was to see what really is causing the problem. We'll link to Bob's recent CropWatch article regarding early season insects on the Market Journal website for more information on scouting and treatment options. Now with this week's weather forecast, here is UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. During this past week, of course, we had some of the very significant activity last week and that did drop some considerable amounts of precipitation across portions of the southwestern sand hills, southwestern corner of the state and of course in northeast Nebraska. Some of these areas received well over two inches and of course unfortunately we didn't see it broad based across the state but there were some areas that did see some favorable precipitation and, and then of course this led to some planting delay issues. We, we had completed about 85 percent of the corn planting according to NASA as of Sunday. I suspected that we've been pretty much stalled out since then and of course as we're getting toward the end of May with uh, soybean planting and of course the remainder of the corn planting left to go 
There is a concern with this recent precipitation. Unfortunately, it does look like we're going to have a very active pattern for this next seven days with the potential for some significant accumulating rainfall across portions of eastern Nebraska. So let's get into the main brunt of the forecast. And as we go to the maps, what we'll notice is that we do have a trough across the western United States that's going to be making its way into the region. We're going to have a southwesterly flow aloft, and we're bringing that moisture at the surface up from the Gulf of Mexico. So we will have the ability to generate some thunderstorm activity, particularly in the late afternoon hours of today. And then that'll carry on overnight. The best area for precipitation will be across eastern Nebraska, less so as you get into western Nebraska. Now, as we go into tomorrow, we'll start to see that trough digging into northern California, and again, more energy will be shooting out into the region. So it's not going to be a complete washout, but we're going to have periods of thunderstorm activity, particularly in the morning, then the redevelopment in the late afternoon to overnight hours. And again, as we go into Monday, we'll see that trough starts to dig even farther, and that's going to give us the ability to start seeing some thunderstorm activity once again develop during the overnight hours. So we're going to have to really pay attention, especially if you're camping, keep a weather radio and, and store because some of these could potentially get severe. Now as we go into Tuesday, the system really starts to get itself cranked up and we're going to big a big moisture feed up into our region and we should see some thunderstorm development again in the late afternoon hours but more importantly as we get into the Wednesday time frame all this energy comes out into Nebraska and there are indications that we could see an excess of two inches of rainfall with thunderstorm development across the eastern half of the state, a little bit less as you get to the western part of the state and this looks to be our best chance for widespread severe weather across the region. As we get into Thursday, Thursday, the system will lift up into the Dakotas. We'll start to see a clearing pattern develop from the southwest to the northeast as the day progresses, but there still may be some isolated thunderstorm activity, particularly over northern portions of the state. And as we get into Friday, that system lifts up into the western Great Lakes. We'll see another trough coming into the western United States. It looks like we shouldn't see anything in the way of thunderstorm activity. So in terms of the forecast going forward, you will notice that we'll see some warm temperatures this weekend with a slight cooling trend as we go through the week, but there's those chances of scattered thunderstorm activity off and on each day with the best chances, particularly uh, tonight and then also on Wednesday. In terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, the warm conditions continue across the eastern half of the United States and in terms of precipitation, a very wet pattern to the north of us and a very dry pattern to the south of us. Thanks, Al. Our interviews from today's show with Kate Brooks, Dave Hamilton, Brad Lubin, Stephen Wagulo, Dennis Hughes, Steve Dritz, and Bob Wright are available individually on the Market Journal website and the Market Journal mobile app. Next week, Elaine Cub will be our marketing analyst, and Greg Kruger will show us his crop rotation research in North Platte. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board.